Alright, so that was Jay Mills featuring Jada Kiss. We're bringing it back right here on Trax FM. And yes, we are bringing back all the interviews on Trax FM. And right now, we will be talking to Dr. Tan Wei Leong, who's a public health physician with the Kandahar State Health Department. And today's topic is the ASEAN Dengue Day. Good morning, Dr. Tan. How are you today? Good morning, JD. Yeah, I'm good here. Alright, Dr. Tan. So I hope you had a really nice holiday. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, back to work. And today we are talking about the ASEAN Dengue Day and getting the questions straight off the bat. Now, Doctor, before we uh, before we uh, move on with the questions, maybe, uh, Doctor, you could tell our listeners for the unaffiliated, what is Dengue, actually? Right, okay. So, uh, I think most of our, uh, the Malaysian, I think we know what, what is dengue. Dengue is actually a vector-borne infectious disease caused by a flyvirus, which is mainly transmitted by uh, the vector, or we call it mosquito, Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus. So, this is the infection that uh, has become endemic in our country for a long, long time ago, yeah. And until now, it is still a main public health issue in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm. So, so in Malaysia, uh, at this moment, we are seeing a lot of the cases again after the uh, COVID pandemic ha- is under control. Yeah, so this is dengue. So it is still one of the main health issues in Malaysia at this moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you just mentioned uh, some of the current situation in dengue, right? What is the actual current yeah. situation of dengue in Malaysia as compared to, say, last year? Okay, sure. So generally, if uh, we are trying to compare the trend, so we can see that actually we have been observing an uprising trend uh, starting from mid of March in this year, 2022, as compared to last year. Uh, and we are anticipating there will be more cases reported after the holiday season, after mm-hmm. the festival season. Mm-hmm. So probably the number of cases that's reported is going to be higher for the coming months. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, what has actually caused the uprising trend of dengue in Malaysia, Dr. Tan? Okay, if we are talking, if we are comparing with uh, 2021 and 2020, at the time we were facing the pandemic of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Hello, Dr. A lot of uh, movement control order at the time, MCO. Mm-hmm. So indirectly, actually, uh, human movement, uh, either is interstate or interdistrict, were much more limited or reduced. So, and this year we can see that we are back to the pre-pandemic uh, time, whereby actually COVID-19 has become endemic as well as dengue as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, our daily life has resumed back, whereby most of us are back into the office and uh, interstate travels and interdistrict travels are Mm-hmm. So as the human movements are increasing, so one of the factors that is going to increase the probability of uh, viral transmission, including this baby virus transmitted by the mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's why we are, uh, we are we are anticipating there are more cases because we can see that during the festive season we have a lot of human movement throughout Malaysia. Uh-huh. So indirectly, yeah, this year actually caused viral transmission as well in between state, in between district, yep. One of the factors, yeah. And also the fact that we have a rather rainy season right now allows for a lot of clean water to be around. And uh, as we know it, dengue breeds in clean water, right? Stagnant clean water. Yeah, definitely. With the frequent rain and Mm -hmm. all the weather factors, yeah, true. All right. And how does a person actually get dengue? Is it possible at the same time for a dengue patient to be co-infected with COVID-19? Alright, in simple word, actually a person may get dengue fever once bitten by an infected Aedes mosquito. Mm-hmm. So usually the female uh, Aedes mosquito will try to feed on the blood from humans mm-hmm. so they can lay the egg. So throughout the process itself, actually they will be able to uh, say inject the virus into our body while the process of uh, biting human. Uh-huh. Alright, so after the biting process, actually that person may start showing a 
spectrum of illness actually within about four to seven days of duration. And then uh, the second question, is it possible for a dengue patient to be co-infected with COVID-19? Yes, it is possible. Actually, if we look at the literature around, uh, for example, there were actually there was a case report in other countries uh, mentioning that actually a patient who uh, was originally diagnosed with dengue fever and eventually diagnosed with COVID-19 within days, actually. So it is possible, actually. Mm -hmm. It's possible for the body to actually uh, succumb to two different diseases at the same time. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, doctor, what we're going to do is we're going to be taking a very, very, very short break, uh, a song, uh, about three minutes. I'm going to put you on hold once again, and once we're back, we still have more questions to talk about the ASEAN Dengue Day. All right, so that was Muse. Welcome back to Health on Tracks. It is currently uh, 11.24 on the clock as of right now, and we are talking to Dr. Tan Wei Leong, who is a public health physician with the Kedah State Health Department on the topic of ASEAN and Dengue Day. Welcome back, doctor. Yeah. All yeah, right. Mickey. And uh, we've already talked about how does a person get dengue? Is it possible for them to be co-infected with COVID-19? And doctor, you said it is quite possible because it's two yeah. uh, separate symptoms. Now, what are some of the common symptoms of dengue fever? And what should they do if they have uh, those symptoms? Okay. Uh, for example, out of four persons that will get infected with the virus, Sometimes only about one of them would be showing symptoms actually, or we would be saying that the rest uh, would be asymptomatic. So only those who come with the symptoms will probably come to the clinic and uh, ask for medical consultation. Mm -hmm. And the most common symptoms that manifested by the patient, uh, it could actually range from the mild, moderate, and even some to the very severe illness. So some of them would be having fever, mm -hmm. severe headache, uh, retroorbital eye pain, muscle joint and bone pain, and then uh, some of them will be having this rashes over their body, over their trunk, over their limbs, mm -hmm. and some of them, if they come with severe illness, they even may have the uh, severe uh, bleeding tendency. Oh, For example, yeah. they could be having, yeah, they could be having some gum bleeding, or they could be having some hematuria, which is blood in the urine, mm -hmm. and some of them with the severe cases, they might even be having the abdominal pain. So those are the very common symptoms that they will be manifesting if they have the uh, dengue infection. Yep. Mm -hmm. So for those who come from the uh, dengue outbreak area or locality, uh, or if they do experience uh, of any of the symptoms that are mentioned, they should be going to the clinic to have the test done to check whether do they have the dengue infection or not. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's more common to be asymptomatic than to show symptoms, is it, Dr. Exactly. Because, oh, wow. Yeah. I never knew that dengue could be asymptomatic. So it's entirely exactly. possible that I've already had dengue before and if I was asymptomatic, I just wouldn't know about it. Not true, but those who are asymptomatic can actually still transmit the virus, actually. Oh. So those are the challenges that we are facing, actually, yeah. Oh, those, wow. are the, uh, yeah those are the patients that we do not come into contact and they uh, could be spreading the viruses, actually. Mm. Yeah. And uh, sometimes we do uh, hear uh, some of these, uh, you know, home remedies, right? Now moving on, uh -huh. <laughs> some home remedies such as uh, drinking crab soup. All that's very tasty, but... And, uh, coconut water yeah. and papaya juice. <laughs> well, does it actually play a part in healing uh, dengue fever? Okay. So back to these all-home remedies. Unfortunately, I would say there's no strong scientific evidence to suggest that those, uh, those methods are effective in uh, treating or healing dengue fever. Mm -hmm. But we know that hydration is important. Uh -huh. But, uh, it is, uh, I mean, for me, we still have to go to the to the clinic for them to check our blood mm -hmm. for proper treatments and all. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that if you stay at home and you keep on using this home remedy, so, and then because we, we, we could be a very uh, complication if we delay the treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially if you need uh, an IV in or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you can't do that at home. You can't be putting crab soup in your bloodstream, right? <laughs> Not exactly going to exactly. work out that well. And of course, as uh, as I, 
If I'm wrong right now, I would, I would like you to correct me. Uh. Dengue is a disease that we there's that there's no actual cure. There's only proper management of the disease, right? Yeah, exactly. You are right because we don't have any antiviral or we don't have any definite treatment uh-huh. to actually kill off the virus. But we are giving supportive treatment to make sure that they have gone through that three three phases. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and to make sure that their body can take it because, as you said, if it gets exactly. too severe, then they start bleeding internally. They have uh, blood in their urine urine and then they have massive uh, body pains and the such exactly. but with proper management uh, it can still be uh, so dengue is not fatal at all yeah, exactly. And uh, so, doctor, as you know, it, uh, dengue uh, can also is one of uh, one of the diseases that can happen when we don't take care of our environment. So, how does the community yep. can actually prevent a dengue fever? Okay. Uh, as what we say, prevention is better than cure. And uh, if we can prevent the disease itself, it would be better if we don't get the disease. Yep, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, we, we, we know that uh, containers, as, uh, especially those artificial containers, mm-hmm. uh, whatever, like polystyrene or any of the bottles, those uh, containers that actually contain clear water could become one of the best breeding sites for our Aedes mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in our, how say, our effort to actually uh, clear off the disease, one of the main measures is actually to uh, eliminate all of the breeding sites from Eddie's mosquitoes. So indirectly, environmental hygiene is very important. So uh, we will need the community to take their own initiatives actually at their own household, at their own working places to actually regulate it. Every week actually they have to spend time to search for any possible Eddie's mosquito breeding site and try to clear off them. If those containers that you really need to actually uh, to, to, to keep the water or to store the water, then you might need to keep on changing it every week. Oh, yeah, because okay. that would actually interrupt the life cycle of Aedes mosquito itself. So we could actually prevent the breeding of Aedes mosquito and that's why we can cut off the cycle of the infection itself, whereby we can clear off the vector. Mm-hmm. That's one of the ways, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. destroy the vector and get rid of the disease. Yeah. Okay. Another another method is actually protecting ourselves then. We can use insect repellent actually. Yeah. We can use insect repellent that's approved by the government and uh, that is to actually chase away the mosquito from us. So uh, without any mosquito bite, so we are safe from the uh, vector-borne disease or the mosquito, mosquito bite. And sometimes, for example, for those who love to do outdoor activity in the early morning or in the evening, mm-hmm. I would strongly suggest that you wear the long sleeve and long long pen to protect all your limbs so you don't get bitten by the mosquitoes, yeah. And you can also wear those uh, mosquito repellent nets around your exactly. face and the such, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, doctor, what we're going to do is we're going to take another short break and once we come back, we'll be ending this interview, yeah? All, all right. right. So, so don't go anywhere. Right now, this is Wide and Nerdy by Weird Al Yankovic and we're going to be back in just a few moments to talk once again to Dr. Tan Wei Leong. Alright, so welcome back. You are currently listening to Health on Tracks with me, uh, KG, and uh, we are talking to Dr. Tan Wei Leong with the, uh, with the Kedah State Health Department, and he's a public health physician, and we are talking about ASEAN Dengue Day. Uh, hello and welcome back, Dr. Tan. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. Uh, all right. Doctor, now I'll just uh, like to ask a, a, a slightly separate question. Now, awareness wise, uh, in terms of dengue awareness in Malaysia, how is it right now? Is it is it getting better? Is the awareness getting higher, much higher? Are people more uh, observant of what actually constitutes as a dengue infection or in the environment where Aedes mosquitoes can breed? Uh, so what's your opinion on that? Okay. Generally speaking, I think uh, what we have done for a long, long time ago in educating the community about the importance of knowing dengue infection and how to prevent dengue infection, I think generally we are at a good stage, actually. Uh I wouldn't say that we don't have any skill at the community level, but we would need a much more highly empowered community to actually to have much more dedication in terms of uh, preventing dengue infection. Definitely Mm -hmm. there, there are more 
more there are more things that we can do actually. Yes. Huh? Actually, yeah, uh, I would say that most of the Malaysian would know what 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 is dengue actually, and even if they can go to their doctors and tell the doctors actually I could be having dengue. Yeah. So uh, what should I do next and all that? Yeah. So the the ever the, the awareness is there, but what we need is actually uh, we need the community to start empower themselves in preventing dengue infection. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like I think uh, nowadays, like if you are at home and you suddenly get sick and you get joint pain, the first thing that comes to mind is <laughs> I have dengue, and then I then you go get it checked out. Sure, sure, sure. All right. Yep. And uh, doctor, any special advice on dengue prevention during the flood season? Yeah, uh, yeah. During the flood season, definitely our main aim is to clean up our house, and then because yeah, we will have a lot of things to do. But throughout the process of cleaning, make sure that uh, I think it will be the same thing as what I mentioned just now. Mm-hmm. We have to make sure all of the possible container, all of the possible breeding site for our mosquito and this mosquito must be cleared off, mm-hmm. because you could be having some water stored or uh, the, any of the container that might contain waters, and maybe it won't. It won't happen at that moment, but you give it about one or two weeks time. So as the mosquito find a good breeding site, they will be laying it and all of that. And that will be the time that there's the start of an outbreak. There's the start of the cause of the disease itself. So mm-hmm. as usual, clear off all the possible containers that could have been uh, the breeding site for our mosquito. At the same time, protect yourself with uh, all the long sleeves and all the insect repellent, avoiding mosquito bite during the cleaning process here. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, any last important message from the Ministry of Health to the community on dengue prevention? Okay, sure. I think the first thing is fighting dengue is not only solely on the Ministry of Health, but we will definitely need the uh, cooperation and the help and the attention from the community. Mm -hmm. We need the community to be much more highly empowered to actually be able to prevent the disease at their household, at their working places. They need to actually do the uh, checking at their house or at their premises every week to make sure there's no breeding site for them. Uh, for Eddie's. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, we will need the community to cooperate with us actually during the time that we are doing our vector control activities during the outbreak time. Uh, yes. Be much more open for us, for us to do our fogging, for us to do our household inspection of mosquito lava. And secondly, anyone that's symptomatic, as mentioned earlier, please come forward to the health clinic for a proper medical checkup. And we hope that early diagnosis will actually prevent complications caused by dengue infection. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Very well said there, Doctor. And of course, at this time, Trax FM would like to thank you for taking your time off yeah. uh, to talk to us and also to uh, educate the you know the listeners on uh, the dangers of dengue as well on uh, its propagation and the methods and also its vector-borne disease uh, status, right? And uh, thank you so much for taking your time, Doctor. I hope you have a good Monday okay. ahead. All thank right. you, PG. Thank you so much. No problem, Doctor. You have a good one. All right, so that was Dr. Tan Wei Leong, who is a public health physician with the Kedah State Health Department. And today we talked about the ASEAN Dengue Day, and that is happening pretty soon, which is in June. And uh, you know what? It will be taking place in Singapore. So that is coming right up. The 5th Asia Dengue Summit 20 uh, will be happening soon, right? So uh, right now, though, it is now time back for more music on Tracks FM. I'm going to be back in a bit.